Let's continue our conversation about DNS and start talking about DNS cache poisoning attacks. Right? Very cool name, very cool kind of attack. So DNS is the system we use to link domain names like google.com to an IP address, which might be changing you know, day to day. And that allows us to type in convenient human readable URLs into bars and actually get a, a website back from a computer that exists, right, which is useful. DNS cache poisoning is, 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 a, is essentially a flaw in DNS where we can inject or an attacker could inject a malicious IP address into a name server so that it tells people to go to this IP address instead of the actual IP address, right? Now, it's less common now. It was quite a big deal when, when these, these attacks first started appearing. We already talked about DNS. Let's talk very briefly. You've got a computer here and you use some process which wants to visit a website or ping some machine. You need to look up that IP address, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to look up your name server of choice, right? Probably your ISP's one or something like that, and you're gonna put in a query here. Now this is a recursive resolver. It's probably not going to know. It will check its cache. This is its cache, right? You will also have a cache, by the way, which for the sake of argument, we don't have anything in it. It will then send off to here, which will go to a root, and then it will go to a, you know, a global top level domain and so on, dot, 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 until it gets to what we call an authoritative name server for that zone, right? And then it will give us an actual IP address. Now this will take some amount of time because there's a few hops here, root and then back and then, you know, and so, because these won't generally speaking forward on our request for us, they're not that, they don't work that hard for our, on our behalf. So there's some amount of time passes when this name server reaches out for an answer where we have an opportunity to give it an answer that it wasn't expecting, right? Which sounds way more exciting than perhaps it is. One thing we talked about was this will put a query ID of let's say 1000 on this query, right? Which will actually eventually go to this name server here. Now, while it's going out with the query ID, we have an opportunity to send back a response with a query ID of 1000 that points to a different machine. So let's imagine this is my nefarious server here, right? So this is sort of my skull and crossbones thing. I mean, it's the worst thing I've ever seen. I've got to try and fix it. How do you make it look like a, oh, I, I know what it is. There we go, That's, is that a bit better? Okay, this is my very nefarious server. And you know, who knows what's on there, like malware and stuff. Um, but what I want to do is this has got a different IP. So let's say for the sake of ease, it's 10.0.9.9. And what's gonna happen is this will come up here and then my attacking machine will send a stream of responses to this with query ID 1000, query ID 1001, query ID 1002, query ID 1003, and so on. Is it just chancing its arm at those numbers? It's just having a go, yeah. And we'll talk about how you choose a query ID in a minute. But yes, basically, it's just sending a sequence of query IDs. And with this name server, it's basically saying, so let's suppose this query was for google.com. This query is also gonna be what is google.com. And we're saying google.com is 10.0.9.9, which it isn't, right? It's my virus server. All that has to happen for this to work, right, is for this query ID to be correct and for this to be received before the actual authoritative answer comes back from a Google name server, right? Which given that this is probably somewhere else in the world, you've got a, you know, a few, couple of hundred milliseconds maybe. If I'm on a similar network to this machine, that could be a big problem to this machine. So how do we guess this query ID? Well, the good news was that you know, back in sort of the early 2000s, they just incremented a counter every time. So if they sent a query ID 1001, you, there, was, there was good money, it was gonna be 1002, the next one, and 1003, and so on. So all you need to do is observe a query ID and then spam it with the next ones up, right? So what you would do is you would send a request to this name server for some unknown domain, right, which points back to your name server and then see what query ID it used, right? So you have a, have a way of sniffing out what the query ID was. And then all you would do is spam, let's say 20 or 30 of the nearest numbers to it and you'd probably hit, right? And then it gets worse, right? Because not only has this now received the wrong answer, but it's also cached it, right? So you say the IP for google.com is this, right? And also this is gonna be valid for 20 days. This is called the time to live. Now, if you set that, then this is gonna not bother, you know, asking actual Google again for 20 days, right? And so what will happen is, so someone else on this website goes, to, someone else here goes to google.com, they get a response that's this IP, which is incorrect, and they will get that same response while that remains in the cache, right? which could be for a long, long time. 
That is a huge problem. If you go to a website, you're, you're, you, know, you don't see the IP address right, on your browser, for example. You just type in, you know, Amazon.co.uk, Nottingham.ac.uk, you you know, YouTube.com. You type them in, the domain name could be anything. Right? There, are, there are other checks and balances like certificates that we can talk about that will prevent this from causing a huge problem. But back when this was a problem, that also wasn't as robust. And that nefarious server, is it likely that it's going to serve up something that looks close enough to the real thing? I, I mean, that depends on what the attacker wants to do, right? But that's one option. Right? What you could do is you could have a fake logon prompt, which looks exactly like the front page for some known social network or something like that. And then you just bag the credentials rather than, um, you know, logging them in because you can't right and then you would forward them to the actual website and they just assume that nothing happened they go oh, that's strange and they'd log in again and it would work the second time because they've been rerouted or you know modern day you would just serve them an exploit kit right which is essentially a web server that stuffs them full of malware as quickly as possible it looks at what browser they're running what fla what you know adobe flash plugins they're running what javascript um and java runtime environments they're running and tries to hit them with the correct targeted payloads Right, which will join them into a botnet or serve them ransomware or something along these lines. You don't really want this to happen to you. Is there a way of flushing out that cache? I mean, this could be done by, by, by an administrator, but they're not going to because no one's, no one's looking at these caches. Right? So no, this... Nobody kind of knows this has happened. No, 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 no. Unless you notice a site nefarious with this website or there's a certificate issue, which is you know, likely these days, for, for, for the web, certainly, for other services not running on, you know, using TLS, then maybe not. There's really no way to know until this expires. Right? That's a huge problem. Now, they did start to mitigate this, right? Because um, it gets a little bit more complicated, you see. So it was, spot it was spotted that incrementing this pop this query number was a bad idea, right? So what they would do instead is they would randomize it, right? Now it's 16 bits, so you've got two to the 16. You've got about 65,000 different query IDs that you could do, right? Now you've got your chance of hitting this is much, much lower. Then comes along Dan Kaminsky in about 2008, right? Who's a security researcher. And he comes up with this idea um, that allows you to get around this issue. Right? So what he does is instead of requesting google.com or facebook.com, he requests, you know, random 1234.google.com, right? And then random 1235.google. Now, those are kind of similar addresses, but they're new each time. So this name server doesn't have them in the cache, and so it performs this lookup, right? And it gives you another opportunity to guess, like, say, 50 random numbers before the actual response comes back. And then you can try again, and then you can try again. And you can do the attack in about 10 seconds. Now, the neat thing about this, because, of course, overriding someone's random 1234.google.com is only useful if they go to that website. The interesting thing about this that was, re you know, really quite good was that what Dan also did was he attaches to the response, oh, and by the way, I don't know for this one, but the authoritative name server for google.com is actually this IP and points the actual name server at the attacker's name server, right? Neat. So, so what happens basically is the name server gets a response, a, a spammed response back that says, I don't know, but this one, this guy might, but don't trust him. Because <laughs> he's, he's, he's shady. So, um, so you have to set up your own name server, but then all bets are off, right? Once you control a name server for some zone, like Google or Facebook or Amazon or something like that, you can then serve whatever IP you want to, for any query that comes in to that one. Right? That's a big, big problem. So the final change that they made, and this was in about 2008 in response to this, was, and I should add, by the way, that there was a single, um, I believe there was a single domain name client that already did this, which was Dan Bernstein's, right? All the others followed suit. They don't just randomize the query ID, they also randomize the source port from which the query originates. So you go, if you remember from networking, you go from an IP to an IP, but you also go from a source port to a destination port, right? That's in TCP or UDP. And or if you randomize that, you've then got 16, 2 to 16 possible queries and 2 to 16-ish, a little bit less, possible ports, right? Then you've got somewhere, you know, technically speaking about 4 billion different possible combinations. Some of the ports are not going to be in use, so maybe hundreds of millions of different combinations. This becomes much, much more difficult, much, much slower. This is not so practical, right? Technically, it's still possible. 
right? They haven't solved the issue. What they've done is made it harder. You know, who, when someone comes along with enough bandwidth to do this, maybe they will, they will be able to pull it off. The long-term solution to something like this is probably not random port numbers and things. It's probably DNSSEC, which is where you actually um, authenticate things like the root and global top level domains and some of these name servers using certificates right, and public key infrastructure. And that means that it's much, much harder to set up a spoof name server because the DNS resolver will check the certificate and realize it's bogus. I'm not going to uh, use this query at all. Um, so this actually already exists in a lot of the higher level domains. Some of the, lots of name servers still don't support this, but it is being rolled out. So that's, you know, a good thing. You only have to work out whether it's worth alerting the user if you find the key. So, you know, you download the temporary exposure key, you perform the, the encryption, you generate the potential RPIs and you compare them with the ones you've seen. And if or if you want a more slightly comprehensible message, it's saying maybe you haven't applied a function to enough arguments.